Welcome to Walk About the Galaxy, the partnership astronomy podcast, where the science is universal, the opinions are personal, and the dialogue is mercurial. We are Strange mm -hmm. Charm and Top the Astrocorks, also known as Josh Cole, Addy Dove, and Jim Cooney, coming to you from the Walkabout Studios at the University of Central Florida. Be sure to stick around at the end of the episode to see and hear me gasp in alarm when I see that the sound equipment did not work. <laughs> that is fairly regular, yeah. unfortunately. <laughs> Our stumpers are residential. Res <laughs> Res <laughs> I was trying to find an adjective for real estate or something. I don't know. Uh -huh. Residential is the best I could come up with. Right. Uh, although they don't, they're not going to sound that way. But this is what I had in mind. Okay. Okay. Uh, Jim. Yes. Two moons or two suns, and by S U N suns, not S O N suns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean, would you rather live on a planet that was orbited by two moons mm -hmm. or on a planet? that orbits two stars. I, it's got, I think I got to go with the two stars. Uh, I, I mean, I... Uh, like Tatooine? Like Tatooine, because... In Star uh, Wars? <laughs> I get seasonally depressed. Mm. Oh. When it's dark. And, I, and we mm -hmm. live in Florida, so it's not even really that bad compared to, you know, more northerly or mm -hmm. southerly latitudes, but... Uh, it's depressing. I want more light. I think with two suns, you'd have a crap ton of light, right? It's, I guess well, it depends on the particulars on of the, the orbit. Orbits. So we have to think about the orbital stability of this whole thing. Right. Because either you got to have those two stars close together and you're very far away from both of them. In, in which, which case, case it's about really the same. Probably, right. yeah. Right or on Tatooine, they sort of rise and set at similar times. The one like. image we have, they look like they're together. Yeah. yeah. But I think or you can have weird you're going stable orbits. One, and the other one is pretty far away. Right. So it's going to be like a bright moon or something. So it may not... I don't know if this is a solution to your problem. What about like like a figure eight orbit? I think there are some a planet with a figure eight orbit around two stars. Around, yeah. Goes around one star and then it goes yeah. around the other. Oh I think there are some complicated but stable orbits like that. that at least in theory. At maybe. least in theory. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's observed. what I'm going for. That's your ideal. That's planet. My, that's where okay. I'm. That's where I'm that's living. Where you want to live? All right. Wasn't there? You're the Isaac Asimov expert. Isn't yeah. there a, an Isaac Asimov short story or novel where there's a planet that? Only get because of something like this. Only gets nighttime once every ten thousand years or something oh, like that. Oh, there is a story like that. And they know that it's coming, and they're like freaking out because they're not sure how everybody's going to react to the first nighttime ever. Right. There is something I don't okay. remember what right, that is called. I'm not an expert. That, for we sure, have to but, track yeah. that down. That, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But that's yeah. where I you want to go. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm going there. All right, I'm going there. Um, Addie, yeah, your habitation question. Yes. This is more complicated. Great. Believe it. Well, it's more complicated. <laughs> no, I don't know. He made a figure eight orbit. Yeah, so. that's true. This is more complicated to describe. Okay. And we're gonna, so you're going to have some jargon here to deal with. Great. Zero degree obliquity mm -hmm. with synchronous rotation. Okay. With a star. Okay. With a star. Okay. Yeah. Or 90 degree obliquity with a normal 24 hour rotation. Mm, okay. So, so zero to be so so Earth has twenty three, three and, and a half degree obliquity. So that means we're tilted, which is why like um, you get sometimes in the northern hemisphere it's night all the time and sometimes it's day all the time, and you get seasonal changes for this reason, right? With zero degree obliquity, you don't really get seasonal changes. Right. So just be. So you're just like face straight up one pole. Right. Your and equator zero, is always directly at the sun, and, and we're not. We're not. And we're synchronous, which means the same. It's like the moon and the Earth. So the same face would always face the right. sun. So one side of your planet would be very warm. Be daytime all the time. Daytime all the time. One there. side would be nighttime that's all the time. Where that's Jim where Jim wants to live. Wants to live. He yes. wants to live on day side. Earth. Well, that's why I didn't give him this one because I thought it'd be too easy. Too for Too easy. Him. Yeah. Um, the other option is a uh, ninety degree obliquity. So sort of like so Uranus. Sort of like Uranus. So you're turned. Is it with the pole facing the sun, well, or it's gonna in it's your gonna orbital change plane. over the course of oh, the year? Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or so it goes like this. Right. <laughs> so at one for the YouTube probably, viewers, the, <laughs> at one time, yeah. So one time of the year, the North and Pole is rotating. pointing straight towards the sun. Yeah. But then a quarter Sometimes of an orbit sort, later, it's barbecuing. Yeah. The equator like, is facing the sun. Right. And then it's just sort then of it's like the other pole. Yeah. Yeah. And then on the other side, and then yeah. on the other side. so I think the second case, the the tilted on its side, tilted on ninety degrees, all and sorts of variety, ninety degrees variety, and twenty four but the, but, hour but, but, rotation. But then you have like a uh, very live? long time of total darkness and very long time of total light. So do you on the first case? No. Yeah. Yeah. You're either always in daytime or We're always, always in nighttime. nighttime, unless right. you're moving all the time. Yeah. So it's a tough, tough call. 
Yeah. Unless you want to always have daytime. Always daytime. I like, I like variation. <laughs> daytime is freaking awesome. Be, there would be I a like, lot of exciting variation. Yeah. That, yeah. And, and that tipped on the side And like thing. snowbirds would have interesting migration routes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Regular yeah. birds would probably have interesting <laughs> migration routes. People would probably be migrating would, like crazy. That's because, what I mean. Yeah. 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 yeah those those kind of snowbirds. Yeah. Human snowbirds. Yeah. yeah. Because with that one. They're all heading here to Florida right if now. If you lived uh, near the North Pole, mm-hmm. there'd be months where it's just the sun is overhead all the time. Yeah. But then there'd be the other months. The other where three-ish it's... months, maybe. So that'd be similar. I mean, it wouldn't be that different, I feel like. I mean, it would be. It would be very different. But well, like, yeah. time-wise, be... it wouldn't be that different from sort of a lot of what we have right yeah, now. Yeah, more extreme. Because it's, it's, it's going around, right? You, you would, have, have, you would have the same total number of darkness hours that we have. It'd be six months of light and six months of dark. It'd just be all at once. But it yeah. wouldn't no be all at once you. because when you're coming around this way, when you're it, coming around be, the side, you still have some light. Uh, I guess not right yeah. at right at the poles. Right. Yeah. Once I you're thought you were living right at the pole. You don't get it. No, well, I'm I, never going to live right at the pole. Yeah, we don't so. want to live at the pole. Okay. Unless anyway. it's the South Pole <laughs> of the Moon, I would live there. All right. Jim wants a planet with all sorts of daytime, he and wants... Addie wants a planet with all sorts of variety. That sounds. Yeah. That sounds fair enough. That sounds. Correct. I like the Earth. Today we're talking about wormholes, Ooh. Uh, instruments on the International Space Station Ooh. with fancy names, um, some new, uh, an interesting discovery about a couple of moons of Neptune. That's you don't say that of, a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to say. We, uh, we've been to Neptune one time, so we don't make new Neptune discoveries very often. Yeah, it's impressive sure. what we can do with the ground-based telescopes. So yeah. there's a cool thing with Neptune. It's cool. I like it because it has to do with orbital dynamics, which I think is Ooh. funky. And this particular result is kind of interesting. We love us some orbital uh, dynamics. We do, I, I love me some good old or, orbital dynamics. Maybe orbital dynamics will sponsor <gasps> the show sometime. So. If they haven't already, I'm surprised. So Quant- probably some aspect of orbital dynamics has. I'm pretty Lagrange sure we've had like a did. Lagrange points. Lagrange Maybe points eccentricity. Did recently. Eccentricity should time. eccentricity should totally sponsor the show. I've heard there's been poems written about it. There have. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should post that a reci- a, an artful recitation. Yes. In any event, uh, a star has gotten the old heave ho from the Milky born. Way. What? Yeah, it's been banished. What did it do? Well, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But oh. first. This episode of Walk About the Galaxy is brought to you by Heavenly Bodies. From 486958 Arrokoth oh, oh, to 1803 nice. Zwicky, Heavenly Bodies has something to suit everyone's taste. For plus-sized models, we have Jupiter with its trademark red spot and dramatic belts and zones, and Saturn with its flashy rings, certain to turn heads on the celestial runway. If you're looking for a rockier lineup, check out our broad selection of over one million asteroids. Going for a cool vibe? We have an ever-increasing cast of Kuiper Belt objects, including Pluto and the Plutinos. Heavenly Bodies is proud to accompany you on your walk about the galaxy. Heavenly Bodies, share the fantasy. Share the fantasy. Yes. I think we've even maybe done that before, but I forgot to cross it off my list. I don't think so. Maybe not. It was not crossed off my list. Share the fantasy. Yeah. Is this a... What, it's, what's it's, our rating on our it's podcast? S H A R E, the fantasy, not share the singer, comma, oh. the fantasy. Oh, really? Which might be <laughs> an interesting just, it's good album musical title. or something yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, share the fantasy now on Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> we'll write it. Uh, I think that is a candy bar. Yeah. Disney World. Chanel number five. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Maybe we have done that. I almost guessed something along those. I was going to guess L'Oreal or something. Well, there you go. There you go. Um, Some some nerd news. Wait, I was going to say something about something we just talked about. Heavenly Bodies. Star kicked out. Oh, about Arakoth. Arakoth. That's, well, that's Space News. We'll do Space News. Ultima Thule. No, MU69. The object formerly, formerly, informally informally known as Ultima Thule. Uh Uh-huh has been given an almost equally unpronounceable new name. But a much uh, more favored name in terms of people and the astronomical community. Uh, yeah. Eric Koth, right. which means sky in Algonquin, so, uh, an Algonquin Indian tribe okay. language. It means sky. Which is native to the Maryland area, which, which is, is where, where the, discovered. the New Horizons team is based, or their the mission, mission, the mission operations is operations there. from there. Yeah. Yeah, and it has a number, 486958. Yeah. Um, yes, so that's the new name for that. That's just the object that the New Horizons mission, which went to Pluto, flew by a couple years ago mm-hmm. on New Year's Day. 
mm-hmm. a couple of years ago, right after flying MU-69. by Pluto. MU sixty nine. Yes. Yeah. Um, other space news: the NASA's announced probably it's going to be a little bit longer before commercial crew yeah. vehicles. Uh, these are SpaceX and, and Boeing. Boeing taking astronauts from U.S. rocket launches up to the ISS. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're saying next summer, summer of 2020. Yeah, so they were supposed to have done it, some demonstration flights already this year. They were supposed to fly the, the two years ago, I think, on the original time, sca- time schedule. Um, and they are not yet flying. They're still like, Is making progress. Is this a NASA issue or a those companies issue? It's a those companies issue mostly, but the there's this new report from the office of the inspector general or mm-hmm. somebody um, that's like there's some se- there's still some safety concerns that are of issue with those two, and because they haven't done all their demonstrations partly, but also like we're now like out of flights that we've booked f- to fly with the Russians to the station. Right. So we have been flying up through the Russians, and we don't have any more seats booked, and they're like eighty two million dollars a seat or something like that. Oh my god. Which yeah. is like more than the cost of the SpaceX launch of four people. Oh my god. Right. Yeah. So like, uh, it costs us a huge amount. To, to do that. So they're probably only going to fly like one astronaut on each of those launches just so we keep a presence, but yeah. it's going to be super reduced and all the science is going to hurt because of it. Oh no. Right. Yeah. They're talking about going to sort of more skeleton crew yeah. on ISS till these launches happen. So they've been doing the tests mm-hmm. for these things, Crew Dragon and the Starliners, the Boeing one, yeah. to make sure that if there's a pad abort or an ascent abort that yeah. the capsule can get away safely and parachute stuff like that. Yeah. But they had various it little problems some, and yeah things with that. It's just slows. SpaceX slows did down. another Space static fire recently that seemed to have gone well. They haven't said anything bad about it yet. It didn't blow up this time, which is, right. the, this is the one that blew up last time. <laughs> yeah. So it didn't blow up this time. So that's a good sign. Always uh, good when your emergency escape system doesn't explode and kill you. <laughs> yeah. No, it wasn't even that. It was, they were doing, well, it was partly that. Yeah. 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 Um, but they also, but, but SpaceX has flown their capsule to the station. They flew their crew right. capsule to the station one time, and Starliner right. hasn't done that part right. yet. Right, so They're both a little... We'll see. Yeah. Soon. Um, speaking of SpaceX, they launched uh, recently Some their next Starlinks. set of the Starlink satellites. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, 60 more of these things that they're planning. And astronomers are excited. Many hundreds, probably <laughs> maybe even many thousands, maybe or even tens, tens of, thousands. of thousands. I mean, of they're definitely satellites. planning on tens of thousands. We, well, they've they've filed paperwork to permit them up to something like 32 or 40,000. Yeah. But their initial filing was for like 10 or 12,000. But they say we can do, we can start like doing business with like, like 800 or 1,000 yeah, or something yeah. like that. It's a lot of satellites. It is. You remember from pre- past episodes <laughs> trivia that <laughs> the number of operational satellites it's currently in orbit like... is like a couple thousand yeah. right now. So. Who do they file paperwork with? Like nobody owns space. So like if they... If you are broadcasting, you have to file with the FCC. But what if you what if you launch if, from a different country? Do I have to still file? have to do that? They they if have to do US. something or, you know, so you're asking what happens if somebody breaks the rules. Right. And then people, the other people who are signatories to those rules get really angry. They say, Mm -hmm. you're cheating. You broke the rules and we're going to, you know, punish you somehow. Mm -hmm. But obviously we can't like go put some other country in jail or vice versa. Right. So you you say, we're not going to talk nice with you anymore. We're not going to play your football team in the World Cup. I don't know. (laughs) But it's, I mean, it's a really interesting point, though, because... Uh, we talked not too long ago about planetary protection and all of that. That also is governed by these international treaties. Right. Well, what do you do if somebody launches a bunch of bugs to the moon? Right. Or Mars? Yeah. Yeah. So we have these these agreements, but we don't have any mechanism to really uh, enforce those agreements. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. we don't have a you know international government or whatever. Right. So. Right. Yeah. Um, the Perseids are peaking this weekend. Those are meteor showers. It's a meteor that's a shower. Meteor shower. Yeah. The Perseids are from Temple Tuttle? I think that's right. Got to confirm this, but I believe they are, that is us passing the Earth's orbit, the Earth's orbit roughly crosses Swift the Tuttle. orbit of a comet called Swift Tuttle. And so that path around the sun is filled, more or less, with debris from that comet. So each year when we go through it, which happens this time of year, mm-hmm. mid-November, then there's seeds. more meteors. And sometimes right. it's more than others because it just depends on the particularities of where, we where are the, the comet itself actually is and where the orbit actually, because things right. things are not uh, exactly repeatable every time. Right. That's fun. You that got, is fun. You got any meteor shower watching plans? I don't think I have any plans, but uh, 
if it's if it's clear and nice, we'll go out there. We've had yeah, some crap weather here recently we in have. Florida, mm-hmm. so we've had a hard time it's seeing anything astronomical. astronomical. Right. Uh, but if it clears out, even the sun. <laughs> been, right, yeah, yeah. We've been challenged to see. No, but that's a, you know, a meteor showers are the kind of thing that you don't need any equipment for. They're not, they're best viewed without a telescope or binoculars or anything like that. You just lie there on your back on a field or something like that and uh, yeah. look up and you'll in a typical meteor shower you'll see I don't know 10 or 20 meters an hour or more yeah. relative to, you know, you might see one or two an hour on a typical random right. non-meteor shower night, so Occasionally, there are some super ones. I don't think this one is predicted to be super dramatic, but there was one many, many years ago, and in Colorado, I went out in the backyard. It didn't go to a very dark sky night, Mm -hmm. dark sky location, but just in my backyard near Boulder, Colorado, I saw one a minute. That was about oh, wow. yeah. I was good. out there for that's an hour. Good. I saw about sixty. Wow, yeah. that's really good. Yeah, yeah. that's pretty awesome. Uh, but I had friends who went out to the middle of nowhere, mm. aka Nebraska. We love you, Nebraska walkabout fans. I thought Ooh. you were going to say and, just like somewhere else in Colorado, though. There's yeah, also a lot of middle went, of nowhere in Colorado. For, yeah, there's. Yeah, I don't know why they went all the way to Nebraska, but they <laughs> did, and sh- they, she reported seeing like a hundred times that many. Oh like wow! Like almost um, one every second. Like wow. just almost continuously. Um, I want to see that. The Astro Quarks got together to see Terminator. We did. Terminator Dark. Dark Fate. Fate. I really liked it. Josh and maybe really more liked than, it. Maybe more than most, but I thought I liked it. And I was, I was uh, really nervous in the first five minutes mm-hmm. because it did the same kind of thing that Alien 3 did in its first five minutes, which was negate the thing that happened in the end of the previous movie. Basically. That's true. Right. Yeah. And that, that's not Where cool. in this case, the like previous that. movie was Terminator 2. Because Where, right. Dark Fate <laughs> ignores all the things in between Terminator 2 and... Right. Dark yeah. Fate, yay. Yeah. So that kind of bummed me out. But I thought but then it that recovered. if it's like, okay, if that's what we're dealing with because we want to make another movie yeah. with Arnold <laughs> and Linda, mm-hmm. then that's what we're dealing with. It was anyway, an enjoyable I movie. Liked it. Good action. It had a really good... Premise actually ended up being okay for most of it. It had a really good airplane zero Yeah, it had some very good action good sequences. Action I was a little sequences. bit minorly disappointed with the story, but I thought the action was phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. That plane sequence... That was great. ...was that really, was, really yeah, well fantastic. done. I didn't like the under... I didn't like the... Spoiler the under, alert, underwater car sequence. I didn't like that either. But... Mm. It was too deep. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Not like uh, intellectually. Not intellectually deep. <laughs> Yeah, but I thought uh, this could have been intellectually deep. They could have they could have gone a little bit further into like what it's like for a Terminator to age and stuff. Obviously, the Arnold is now yeah. like a billion years old, and so they couldn't, you know, Arnold. They couldn't make him look young. I mean, I guess they could with technology these days, but they didn't try to they make him look young. They did at one point young. make him look young, right? They did for some like you know for things that happened before, but they they actually I, had him as old and well, uh, and he had and, ma- and changed and changed right. He changed yeah. and, you know he his. His AI had changed yeah. and right. so forth, which was, cool. which was cool, but I thought they could have explored that uh, more. Yeah. But anyway, very good movie. Yeah. yeah. We, all, we all enjoyed it. You want to see a movie that's sort of like um, Logan? Uh, we had like the, Logan, the Logan for Wolverine. Logan was very But good. you want to yeah. see that for a Terminator. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Uh, with the Ashcrooks also assembled last weekend uh, at uh, my place. That's true. And... I don't know if Jim got a chance, but I know you and I both played around with the Oculus Quest. Oh, we did, yeah. Oh, I did That's not. I missed that. that. Did you miss that? The VR game. VR game. I I did some car mechanic stuff, and I oh that was pretty fun. The game I played was a cross between a Star Wars lightsaber duel and Ooh. Rock Band. Oh, what? So I think they're oh, like, hey, let's do a Star Wars game. Oh, we don't own Star Wars. Oh, let's do a Rock Band game. Oh, we don't own Rock Band. <laughs> I know. We'll have people swipe lightsabers at flying colored blocks to music. So yes. that was the game. <laughs> yes. Which seemed odd. But, but the, it's fun. But it was, the VR thing was the super cool. The VR thing is cool. Yeah. And then the final bit of nerd news I have for you uh, yeah. guys is, are you aware of the Sonic the Hedgehog movie? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yes. Okay. Are you, so, yes. so that's a video game, right? It, it was a video it was game. A video it still game. is a video game. And they're making a movie of it. A live action movie. Is it live action? I think so. Yeah, with a, with a CGI with Sonic the Hedgehog. With a CGI Sonic. And with, then there was a big uproar. There was a big uproar about his fur. And he, his teeth. He what? Looked, he was too toothy he was and furry. Super weird looking. <laughs> for people who are used to Sonic the Hedgehog from the game, he looked too much like yeah. Alf or something. It or, was you so know, weird. 
So there was a big uproar. Mm -hmm. And so Paramount said, like, okay, we're delaying the release of this movie and going back and redoing all the CGI of the main character. Yeah. And so they redid it. And I'm like, looking at him, like, what's the difference? Because I don't really know Sonic. I'm like, okay, (laughs) this one's a little furrier and looks a little meaner, kind of. And less cartoony. Anyway, that's been redone. That movie's coming out in February. I just thought that was a funny story. Mm. And in researching that, because I research all these stories, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in researching that, I discovered that Sonic the Hedgehog is from another planet. It's true. This is what he looked like in the... So he's not really a hedgehog. He's... Well, of course he's not a hedgehog. Have you seen him? Hedgehogs can't do that. That bothers me. Right. He could be a hedgehog. are a terrestrial organism. Exactly. He could be a hedgehog from another planet. Why? Well, no. no, it's not a hedgehog. Hedgehogs evolved it's on different Earth. different species. You don't know that. There oh, could have been some panspermia oh, that transported f- some hey, hedgehog watch your language. genes <laughs> to a different planet, and they evolved there also. All right. Uh, <laughs> let's. Uh, so is it a convergent evolution thing, then? L- let's talk about the alpha... Magnetic... Spectrometer. Spectrometer. Oh, we should have had Jim finish that. <laughs> the alpha? I don't think he knew what was coming next. <laughs> so this is AMS. Um, so what is the alpha magnetic spectrometer? It is a instrument on the International Space Station. Great. Yeah. And it does Science. spectra of <laughs> alpha, alpha magnetics. Something mm-hmm. alpha particles that are doing something. So, I don't know so what it's it a is. particle physics experiment that's, that's why been up you're on here the, to tell us. That's why we're here to and why are we talking about it? So so AMS is a particle physics experiment that's been up on the ISS since about 2011. Um, so it launched dur- uh, during one of the last space shuttle missions. Oh, yeah. uh, they took it up and it got installed on space station. But it actually has like a, a way longer history. I was reading a little bit about it today and it's got a, it has a way longer history than that. Um, it flew, originally flew, AMS-1 flew on a space shuttle mission in 1998. It was like a demonstration and they learned some stuff about the hardware. Um, and then this instrument was installed on space station in 2011 and they've been taking data ever since. But it has these, um, it has some like cooling systems and stuff like that. Oh, um, they had to, they had to. That they have been breaking down uh, over time. So three of the four coolant pumps had failed by earlier this year. And the fourth one was, like, not really working anymore. And there's a few other things they've been wanting to fix. Are those coolants for – does it have magnets? It does have magnets. Sometimes. It's for also for the – it's also for trackers. What's the point of this thing? What does it do? So wait, let me finish the – the okay. reason I'm talking about it today oh, okay. is that it's starting to break down, and like we used to service Hubble, mm-hmm. they're actually going to service this instrument. So they've been working on these really super, like some of the most complex spacewalks we've ever done to fix this instrument up on board the Because it wasn't really planned station. to be serviced originally? Because they think it wasn't necessarily planned to be serviced, but it's like things that are um, relatively... Like, and it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't planned to be serviced in space. So, like, Uh the hardware isn't designed to be used, like, easily and things like that. There's not easily accessible hatches. Got to have the right tools and get to it and everything. Yeah, so they've had to, like, design new tools and teach, they go through really long steps to teach these astronauts, like, how to do the procedures. Right. Um, So the first spacewalk was today, as we're recording. um, Oh, which is why I was inspired to talk about it. Um, so it went really well. So I think Luca Parmatello and Nick Haig did the spacewalk, and it was a it was a two men spacewalk. Oh, congratulations, men! Hey. <laughs> finally, um, <laughs> finally, uh, but also international. Um, and so they did the first set of repairs today, and it went really well, I think. But so what is the AMS? It is a particle uh, physics instrument that is designed to um, study, like, a lot of really high-energy particles and also look for things like quarks. What? Um, what? And, and so is it detect, does it detect so it's interested alpha in, particles? It's interested in antimatter and dark matter, and it was originally Who called isn't? the antimatter uh, spectrometer or antimatter instrument, but they renamed it. Antimatter instrument is much better than alpha magnetic spectrometer. Right? I don't know why they renamed it. <laughs> antimatter instrument's the kind of thing I would have had in my science fiction short story when I was in eighth grade. For sure. Right? Yeah. yeah. Eighth Let's grade. The I, I, but that's like third grade. I'd do it now. So okay. it has. So it's a radiation detector. Instrument. It looks for high energy particles. Um, and it does, it has like a time of flight, uh, spectrometer. So it can actually look so at, it's detecting particles or it's detecting radiation. It detects high energy radiation. So I think some places it calls them particles and some places it calls it, ra- I think most places it calls it particles actually. Mm-hmm. Um, it says radiation and particles. Oh yeah. Okay. And the cooling, 
Ma- some people, I know definitely some people with magnets like their magnets to be really cold. So I think, so mm. it has magnets that are, but they're permanent magnets. I think the cooling is actually for the trackers. So it has um, silicon trackers that measure the charged particles in the magnetic field, and those things have to be cooled. Okay. Apparently. So it has to do with the magnetic field, but it's not actually the magnets that are, they're not super cooled magnets. That's okay. not why. That's not why that's the not why is they're there. Cooling them. And the, um, and what are they going to do? It has a ring imaging Cherenkov detector also. Cherenkov! So we just talked about that kind of radiation Yay. recently. Yeah. So it has a detector to measure um, fast particles, so this uh, is high velocity particles too. So it's a little bit like, yeah, this is a little bit like the particle detectors that we have in our uh, um, particle colliders like CERN and mm-hmm. uh, but LHC space, and stuff. Except it's in, using naturally accelerated particles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So it's complementary measurements to some of those, those CERN measurements right. and a few other high energy particle experiments. Yeah. Um, so the Cherenkov radiation we talked about uh, in mm-hmm. a recent episode happens when a particle is moving faster than s- th- through some medium that light then light moves through that medium. Yes. So is this Cherenkov, what's the medium? That it measures the, the velocity is- of particles. So it can actually, it just like, I don't know, it's, I don't know let me click on the detector. Yeah, I'm sure that it's, it's like, you know, I mean, in, in particle detectors that you have, you know, you like in a particle accelerator, you smash things together and then mm-hmm. the results of those fly into these particle detectors. And particle detectors aren't a vacuum, they're some they're stuff. stuff. And, yeah. and but you're crashing these things together and in this case, they're just out in space moving that fast anyway. And yeah. so... And I don't know what the medium in the ring imaging Cherenkov detector is. Rich. Okay. That's a good acronym. Rich. <laughs> oh, it is. Um, it has some sort of transparent refractive medium. But okay. I don't know oh, what okay. that medium right. is. Okay. That yeah. it flows so there's to. some stuff. So that's where it's going to get yeah. that Cherenkov radiation. Yeah. And they've, so they've been operating for, there's these funny statistics. So I won't tell too many more details, but there's these funny statistics. So it's been operating since 2011, and they've detected more than 120 billion events in the first seven years. That's a lot of so data. So they've had t- they have so much data, and they want to understand search for antimatter origin. So they look for anti helium. And some other what? like helium particle uh, things. So they detect anti nuclei, is what they're uh. looking for. Um, they also look for other exotic sources for like positrons, anti positron stuff. Um, and they're looking for like strangelets, which have to do with quarks, what? how quarks form. Um, strangelets? Yeah. I should know all about those. You should know all about those. Are there those. charmlets and toplets too? Um, so <laughs> it, it has to do with like different combinations of quarks and particles. Sometimes they're known as strangelets that can have very extremely large masses, but very small charge to mass ratios. Mm. It's an equal number of up, down, and strange quarks. Interesting. Uh, yeah, because remember, because most most stuff is made of up and down quarks. The regular mm-hmm. most protons, protons, and protons and things neutrons that we know are, of are up are and down. Up and down. Uh, but the, the the next kind of generation of quarks are the the strange and charm quarks, and they are. Very similar to the up and down, but uh, same charges, but much, much more massive. Mm-hmm. I see. Mm-hmm. And so you can make similar things to a neutron or a proton with those things or some mix of those things. And uh, But they'd uh, be more massive but less chargy than a proton. Right. Yeah. Or same chargy but much more massive. So the ratio right. yeah, yeah, yeah. of that. Yeah. Yeah, same yeah, yeah. chargy. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So it's yeah. they're hoping to, I guess, continue to take this sort of long duration exposure data to understand all these high energy okay. particles. And they're getting a lot of things about like different types of particles because they can measure the energy of the particles. So seems like that's the thing these days in a lot of these things is, is data management. Like they, they take oh, yeah. so much data and all right. these physics and astronomy the instruments event, these the days. The Event Horizon Telescope, oh. they're like jetting around the world. Yeah, because you can't hundreds of pounds of <laughs> yeah. high density disk drives <laughs> yeah. in order to get the data from one point to another to put yeah. it all together. You have to use all kind of new uh, prefixes that uh, we've never heard of because right. there's too many 10 to the so many pounds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ridiculous. Well, there are some of these things that the the amount of data storage is mm-hmm. growing and if you just say well, let me just blindly extrapolate that at a certain yeah. point greater than the mass of the earth will be Data in the storage. Mass of data storage <laughs> I guess we got to find some asteroids to put our data storage <laughs> right. devices yeah. on. Oh, I, you said jetting, and it reminded me of one other space news event. Yeah. Uh, I flew on a parabolic flight this week. Oh, yeah. Yay! Did zero, you throw off? Zero, I did not. Yeah. It was actually one of the easiest flights I've done. Nice. Because I'm getting better really, in my age, apparently. Really cool videos. From we got that some too. super cool science videos and some interesting operation stuff. So Landslides on asteroids and comets mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give you the trivia question now, okay. which will segue us to our next topic. Great. Okay. I'm ready. Uh, I love a good segue. I feel so smart. Our, our next topic is about moons, and so this is a moon trivia. Uh-oh. It has, I'm not feeling as smart anymore. It has... Not multi- the moon. Multiple parts. 
<laughs> what? <laughs> Oh, we haven't you had can, a trivia with multiple can, parts in so long. In like since the last since episode. Like since the last episode, yeah. Uh, so you can choose how you want to address this while you're thinking about the answer when we get, to, which we'll get to at the end of the show. What moon in our solar system has the longest orbital period? Mm. Since there are a lot of moons, you may not know the names around of all its of them. parent body or the sun. Around its parent body. Okay. Uh, how long is that orbital period? Okay. And what planet is that around? Okay. And so what I'll do is I'm going to give you the planet's multiple choice. But that's not is very... Is it zero through very, eight? <laughs> no, it's um, five through eight, basically. Five through nine, basically. Okay. Uh, so it's around Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, or Pluto. Those are your five choices. It's Good, I would have guessed one of those. You would have guessed one of those. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not... The Earth's moon or Mars's moons. Okay. So that's not super challenging there. Um, but the length of the orbit, so for the Earth, it's about a month, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, for Mars's for the moon. moons, they're short. They're close to a day, mm-hmm. one or two day type orbits. So there's some context to think about with that. Um, I will give you, after you guess the name of the planet, a multiple choice for the name of the moon. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, so that's I'm that's excited. that mull so, it over. So the the um, the moon sciency topic we had was about uh, an analysis of two moons of Neptune. You like Neptune? I do like Neptune. It's a Neptune fun was part of my doctoral research. The rings around Neptune. Just a couple of years ago. Just a few years ago. I'll say this. I've said this before. I think, but I'll say it again. I'm sad that we've been to Neptune one time. Do you wish we'd been fewer times? <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm so sad we went to Neptune. No, I mean, Just like... we haven't been back? It's ludicrous. Well... I mean, it's real far away, Jim. It it's is, so far away, but, like... It's almost as far away as Pluto. It is. It's harder to get to Neptune than that place you go in but Canada so, sometimes for fishing. <laughs> <laughs> it's so different and interesting. Uh, I mean, like... It is Both Uranus and Neptune were visited one time, right, by Voyager 2 as it flew by. And, like, visited, and not even visited is a generous only, yeah, term. Flying by at 40,000 <laughs> miles an hour or whatever right. like this. Yeah. Uh, and to me, that's sad because, I mean, there are... I mean, they're very different planets from Jupiter and Saturn and very, very different planets, obviously, from the terrestrial world. So we haven't been there. They have interesting moons, ring systems, and so right. forth. I think a mission to these outer planets where you have an orbiter for one of the two, at least, would be something that we should be doing. Anyway. Some of those things are being proposed thought about, and yeah. discussed or thought about, but they've been being thought about and proposed and discussed for some time. because right. it's, the f- the it's hard to do. It's expensive. Yeah. It takes a long time. Voyager 2 flew by Uranus in January 1986 and flew by Neptune in the summer of 1989. I've heard about so that So that's song. 30 years ago that yeah. Voyager 2 summer flew by Neptune. It's a good song. Um, <laughs> 16. Uh, one of the bonuses for a visit to Neptune mm-hmm. is that its largest moon, Triton, mm-hmm. which is a f- good-sized moon, is basically Pluto. That's true. It's right. another Pluto thing that right. was probably, to the best of our understanding, was captured into orbit around Neptune. Yeah. Right. So, so you get sort of two planets in one. Yeah. yeah. If you go to Neptune. Yeah. I mean, so, we only have images of a handful of this uh, part of the surface of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just call it Pluto a planet <laughs> twice in this podcast. <laughs> but yeah, so Triton has all kind of weird terrain and stuff on it. And cantaloupe we only have terrain. Cantaloupe, cantaloupe terrain. terrain. It's it has got some, like, seemingly smoky, active volcanoes. It had these smoky cryo geysers. volcanoes. Cryo yeah. yeah. So like, uh, let's get our butts out there. Check yeah. It out. Yeah. I'm I'm all for it. All right. I agree. All right. It's a good yeah, place to go. Yeah, imagine how amazing those images would be if we had the high resolution that we I have at know. Pluto. Mm-hmm. Triton's got to be fascinating. Or if you could orbit it yeah. and really get yeah. some good stuff. Yeah, Neptune, get a lot of cool yeah. All right, stuff. everybody, let's start a ground spell for going back to Neptune. This particular story is a sort of celestial mechanics uh, oddity. Uh, Neptune's got about a dozen moons, and like all of the outer planets... There are some so-called regular moons. These are moons that are probably formed when the planet formed, swirling stuff going around the planet in the same direction. And then a bunch of irregular moons, which is the term we use for moons that were probably captured. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And frequently those are orbiting backwards, but not always. Triton is not a backwards orbiter, but it probably is a captured uh, object. Um, So two of the... Uh, moons of Neptune, they've studied uh, their orbits and found that they're in a particular configuration, what we call an orbital resonance. And 
I thought it, the, the, Triton does orbit opposite. Triton, Triton, Triton is, is a, re- it does a regular. Yeah. No, it's not irregular, but it's I a mean, retrograde. It's, it is retrograde. It's retrograde. Yeah. retrograde. I'm sorry. It's okay. And highly inclined. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. So it's my okay. bad. Because it is captured and it's, yeah, retrograde. Yeah. Okay. It's fine. We corrected it. Continue. Okay. These other moons. Okay. There's some wording in this confu- this paper, whatever. The anyway. paper confused me. <gasps> what? Because <laughs> it says Triton is a captured moon after all. As though that's a surprise because it oh. was listed in the other that's thing. Weird. Anyway. Anyway. These other moons. These two moons. Called um, Nyad. Nyad and Thalesa. And Thalesa. We're probably pronouncing those correctly. <laughs> are in a resonance with each other. And so a typical example of resonance that we use all the time are the Galilean satellites where the moon Io goes around exactly four times in the time that Europa goes around twice which is exactly the same time that Ganymede goes around once. Right. Mm-hmm. So that means there's two orbits for Io for every one orbit of Europa. We call that a two-to-one resonance. Guess what? This could have been a trivia, but it isn't. Oh. Can you guess what the resonant numbers are for Thalesa and Nyad? I hope they're like something crazy, like 15 to 13 or 17 something. To th- or 7 to 3. They're crazier than either one of those. What? 73 to <laughs> 69. What? <laughs> yes. So... That's, is that is that even really a resonance? <laughs> yeah, well, they are doing that. They're doing so when moons are in resonance, you can just usually say, it's like two to one or right, th- yeah. one to three kind of thing. That's right. why we're laughing. Yeah, That's why so these, these numbers are, are so ridiculous. Yeah, these are just like well, sure, you could always find <laughs> some numbers that <laughs> yeah. work out for any two things, which is true, right? Fifty you, to two. If you want to go up to big enough numbers, you're going to find two whole numbers that will pretty much work. Mm-hmm. But the the thing that shows that it's in that resonance is not just, oh, the ratio of those times it takes for them to go around. It's if a combination of the positions of the moons, when you add them up with those numbers Mm -hmm. attached to them, and then another number that makes the difference between, in this case, 73 and 69. Mm -hmm. So four times another periodicity in the system. Anyway, you put all those numbers together, you get an angle. And if that angle, when you measure it for what the moons are doing, doesn't move, then it's in that resonance. And that's what's going on here. And this moon is a, f- these two moons are in a fourth order resonance. 73 minus 69 is four. That's, that's really true. weird. It's weird for it to be such a big number. It is the only uh, fourth order, first fourth order resonance discovered between any of the moons and the outer planets. Is that because we haven't really looked for those ridiculous resonances? No, because the higher that difference goes, the, yeah. the higher the order goes, the weaker the resonance. Yeah. So, so these y- things are, are, are they're in the resonance because they're gravitationally pulling and tugging on each other and making sure that they sort of stay in a special configuration. Mm-hmm. And that special configuration, like, keeps them from running into each other. Right. So Neptune and Pluto are in a resonance. Right. But it's like three to two. Right. First order. And it protects Pluto from running into Neptune. Right. It's so, also why it doesn't have its own orbit. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Um, it's not. So, uh, so this is just an unusual resonance and also... Frequently, the resonances we see have to do with the moon's, um, what we call the eccentricity, which is how egg-shaped the orbits are. Mm -hmm. So they're sort of moving in and out. You know, our moon gets closer to the Earth and farther away. But in this one, it's the tilt of the moon's orbits. And so they do this funny vertical dance with each other as they go around. So there's a really cool video that shows these two moons dancing around Neptune. Nice. Uh, They think that two other moons, they think might be in a 13 to 11 resonance, Mm. which that one sounds so boring by comparison. (laughs) 13 to 11, second order, just sort of your normal odd numbers Mm -hmm, there. mm -hmm. But they need more measurements. But one of the useful things about this, besides obviously me finding it amusing, Uh (laughs) but one of the useful things about it is because the gravitational tug and pull between the moons is what keeps them in the resonance. Mm -hmm. When you see that resonance and you see how that angle wobbles, you measure the masses of the moons. Yeah. And they're little tiny moons, so it's really hard to do anything like that. Yeah, they're just dots. They're not even as big as dots in these (laughs) images. And so they got the masses, and we know how big they are um, by looking at those dots and from Voyager. And so they get density, and the densities are about like water ice. And these observations are taken with Hubble. HST. HST, yep. yeah. Yep. So anyway, it's a cool That's little. Cool. It's a cool little discovery. So and they're mostly ice. Yeah, and, and a lot of the yeah, these moons are crazy. The sizes of they're tiny. They're a few tens of kilometers. I have to get the six. Yeah, about a hundred kilometers. Yeah, 
not yet into Lisa. But they're uh, they're of course abnormally shaped, so they're like longer right. women than the other. And, right. Yeah. yeah. Fun. In, in close to Neptune, so they yeah. neither one of those is the answer to the trivia question. Just, oh, okay. Just Good. as a hint that I've removed two of the two hundred and fifty moons in the solar system Perfect. from your consideration. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Narrowing so, it down. Yeah. Cool. Well, before we get to the answer of the trivia, mm-hmm. we want to hear about wormholes. Let's just talk about wormholes for a few minutes. Okay. For fun, when you have an apple, uh huh, there's a little worm in it. You get a wormhole. Nice. Yep. Done. Walk about Done. the galaxy, the botanical <laughs> astronomy podcast. Edible. There you go. Um, so wormholes. Oh, there's a worm in it. Wormholes are a, a, a sci-fi staple. Yes. Right. If you want to get from one place in the universe to somewhere else really fast, you can either just ignore the laws of physics and travel faster than the speed of light, which we often do, or yes. you can take wormholes. Yes. Uh, that's what they did in Interstellar, for example. One of our uh, uh, favorite movies to favorite talk movies about, to beef about. Yeah. Um, but that's how they got from you know our solar system to this other. Exotic solar system somewhere else you in some other paper galaxy, in half and then you punch a hole through it. Right, Ta-da. right. Done. Yeah, they explain how it works right they in do. Interstellar when they're about to do they're, it. They're and... explaining it to each other, of course, which is ludicrous, <laughs> but they are explaining it to the audience. <laughs> It'd be like uh, race car drivers as they're about to get in the car. They're like, so the way the car works is it's got a, <laughs> yeah. it's got a V eight engine in there. Put the gas around in a circle, right? <laughs> Um, this thing turns it. <laughs> Step on this pedal to go. But uh, but wormholes are one of these things. It's a fun thing. They're uh, you know they're another prediction or at least something that is allowed by Einstein's general theory of relativity, which, of course, that theory has been extremely well tested and every prediction it's made has come true. Uh, one of the solutions to Einstein's theories, uh, Einstein's equations allows for, these, <laughs> <laughs> allows for the existence of uh, wormholes, which are basically yeah, like these connections between two disparate points in the universe Possibly even, and this is starting to sound very Uh-oh. weird, but possibly... Two different times? Two different universes. Oh. Um, I was hoping you were going to say two different times. Well, it could be two you different could, yeah. points in space-time, which could mean two different times, but it also could mean a connection between our universe and a different universe for whatever that actually means. You see, we have a really hard time uh, uh, understanding what the solutions to Einstein's equations always mean. Right. Because they're always expressed in these very odd coordinate systems, and we don't really understand what the coordinates mean. You know, normally when we talk about coordinates, we're talking about, like, the X and Y and the Z axis, and I know what those things mean right. in my everyday life, or time, I know what, the, but mm-hmm. uh, in general relativity, things, the coordinates can get very odd, and are, they don't, they're not really describing exactly the, you know, so... Not describing space as we know it. Right, it's, it's, right. So it becomes hard to, to, to visualize or understand what they're talking about. But these things are a possibility. And in fact, uh, we recently ran across a paper where they were uh, suggesting that you might be able to actually look for some of these things mm. uh, if they were real. Uh, so one trouble with uh, wormholes as predicted is that they're very unstable things. Oh. So that... Uh, it's not something you could actually go back and forth between, like oh, in like Star in Trek or like in Interstellar. Well, right. But in Deep Space Nine, it's there's a stable the, it's a stabilized, it's a stable but wormhole. it's stabilized by the aliens that live in it. Right. The there is a way profits, to stabilize yeah. a wormhole. And the with, way to stabilize a wormhole is... With profits. With the profits. orb of prophecy <laughs> and change. Know, but, but they must be using some physics. Probably. And the physics is... Uh, you need some kind of exotic matter that has like a strange negative lits? energy density. Can, can the AMS detect no. that? Matter? Uh, no, no. Uh, this what is, is stranger. Negative, negative energy. Negative density. energy density. So this is it's something what I carry that, with like, me all the time. Uh, that we don't. Just kidding. To our the best of our knowledge doesn't exist, but might. Right. So this is some weird thing that that hints of it could possibly exist in the thing called the Casimir effect and so forth in quantum physics. It's, it's conceivable, but unlikely that it actually exists in the real universe. Cool. Okay. If it does, then if you slap that, <laughs> some of that stuff down near the neck of the... Shoot it up in a wormhole. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you shoot it up in that wormhole. What did More you say good. the show was rated again? <laughs> <laughs> then it stabilizes the wormhole, and then you could actually pass through it and back and forth. It. But don't... I always thought like a wormhole was something... had something to do with black holes It or does, something. it does. It's like a... Because a black hole we think of as just like it's a hole and nothing ever gets out of it. But It's black? But if you connect it... Right, and so and we always have these pictures of black holes. Of course, this is a radio show, not a right. radio show, but a thing. Pictures of these black holes in like a two-dimensional version, where it's this hole that goes down, and it's a skinny, skinny hole that goes down as you go. But but that doesn't have to stop. It can keep going and open up somewhere else. Right. And so a black hole kind of connected to another black hole, 
which we might call a white hole. Uh, right. We would call that an Einstein Rosen bridge, and oh, that would they connect use those in these Thor. two. And there, we wouldn't run into a singularity. In the no, world. you wouldn't run into a singularity okay, if you get through. So that's the only reason I haven't done it. But oh, so then you need somebody with a sword that guards the gate to use that <laughs> Einstein Rosen bridge. That's this a Thor is real reference. science. Thor, okay. Yeah. Real science, kind of. But somebody actually proposed <laughs> that you might be able to actually. So we were looking, thinking about our favorite black hole, which is. Sagittarius A star. Sagittarius A star. Uh, Sagittarius, because one thing that would happen if you had one of these wormholes, if your black hole that you were looking at was actually a wormhole, was perhaps influences from things on the other side of the wormhole could affect things on this side, oh. right? Gravitational influences, for example. So if there were very massive things near the other end of the black hole, other end of the wormhole, excuse me, that would affect the motions of things on this side. Oh. And, I have a we, question. and we see stars very, very close to our Sagittarius A star. Oh. Specifically, there's a star called SO2, which orbits really close to mm-hmm. or comes really close at some, certain times to Sagittarius A star. Mm-hmm. And they've suggested that maybe if we carefully enough lock down the orbital mechanics of SO2, we might be able to detect the influence, unseen gravitational influence from the other side of the wormhole if, if it, it really exists. is a wormhole. And speaking, In reality, that's going to be super hard because there's all kinds of influences from other unseen things near that black hole. Speaking of Sagittarius A star, it's made some news recently also. That's right. That's right. It, it, actually, I was excited to see this in like actual news sites and stuff oh. like that. Uh, Sagittarius A star, I guess, kicked out a star from our galaxy not that long ago. Uh, when we say that, it's not out of our galaxy yet. yet. It's going to take a very oh, long it time. It has been kicked out. It has been shown the door. It has been shown the door, yeah. It, it, <laughs> it, it, uh, it had a close encounter with Sagittarius A star, and it accelerated uh, that star to some ludicrous speed. Now I forget what the speed was, but millions of I kilometers we per hour. I did mm. see one article that said it it, 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 it was like yeeted out. <laughs> yeeted? Yeah. That's so, something kids these I don't know what saying. that. I don't know what that yeah, means. It means everything and nothing. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, oh, it got yeeted out then. That's what Brooke said that too, and I didn't know that I was a understand. thing. Do you know, is that a thing? Yeah. All right. It means okay. both everything. And there's a really <laughs> great YouTube video you in which it? they just, Y-E-E-T, obviously. That's a, that's a thing I wasn't aware of. That's not acceptable in Scrabble. No. Anyway, Sagittarius A star <laughs> yeah. has shown a star the door. It's, it has said so the exit out. to the Milky Way it's, is it's out. 50,000 light years in that direction on your way, sir. Yes. So moving at like 6,000 miles an hour or 6,000 kilometers an hour or something like that, uh, it's going to take crazy it 100 fast, million it's, it's years, hundred million to, get years to get out. But it's on a trajectory that's out, which is interesting. I mean, because uh, we've talked a lot about interstellar planets and interstellar comets recently. Mm-hmm. Right. This would this will become an intergalactic, intergalactic. star. Yay. Right, right. And it actually very well might someday might travel, you know, head through Andromeda or something right. like that. And then... That's cool. They're going to have people, a star from people, a different galaxy. People there would have a visitor from another galaxy because yeah, nice. there could be planets around that star for all we know. Absolutely. And they would presumably still be fine and just flying along with a star. Absolutely. All right. Moon with the longest orbit. What planet say you? I'm going with... You got something? Come on. I'm going with Pluto. Okay. I'm going to go with Saturn. Okay. It's, in fact... Neptune. Neptune. Oh, oh, is it? Is the answer in the article we gun. read? Yes. Oh, well, <laughs> then uh, I probably no. read the answer. The answer I, w- I I encountered information about this moon while researching the story about the Neptune thing. Okay. Uh, so that kind of so the name of that moon it's Neptune is it's Niso, not Pluto. Niso. Mm-hmm. Or ne- I don't know any S O. Okay. So just guess the uh, the length in days. Length in days of, of its, its orbit. orbit. Our moon is 27 days, something like that. Uh, uh, Mars's moons is one or two days. Uh, the Death Star moon of Saturn, Mimas, is like half a day. What's well, its resonance with? And no, I'm just kidding. Not resonant um, with anything. I think it's in days or days. is it in days? 263 okay. days. No, it's got to be way longer than that, right? If it, it's, it's an irregular, if it's irregular distant satellite, satellite, it's very, very distant. It is way longer than that. Something like... Sorry, Jim. Uh, uh, 30,000 days. Uh, 9,374, which is uh, about 30, 27 30, years, I think, or something wow. like that. Wow. So it takes it almost as long to orbit Neptune as it takes Saturn to orbit the sun. Uh, yeah, nice. Yeah. So is so it a resonant? I'm just kidding. No, it's not. It's on a very <laughs> I know, I know, I know. highly elongated orbit, uh, and that's super crazy long. 
Yeah. 27 years. To go around that the is crazy long. 27 years. That yeah. is crazy long. It's, it's surprising. I guess, I don't know. At first, it seems surprising to me that it could hold on to a moon that had such an a orbit distance. that was that far. Right. But I guess that space out at Neptune's orbit is pretty, pretty empty. Things are real far right. apart. Yeah. So Neptune's sphere of influence is pretty big. Pretty big, yeah. Which is why ne- Pluto is not necessarily a bad guess. Right. Except that's Pluto's why that's... so low mass. Right. That's the downside for Pluto. Yeah. Right. But th- but that also means that orbits are slower, closer in. That's true. Which is why I was guessing that. But yes, I that's was true. Correct. Yeah. Um, P- Styx, which is Styx. just one of Pluto's moons randomly that I picked as a 20-day orbit. It's not the longest of the ones for Pluto. But it's Hydra? No. Have they named all the p- moons yeah. of Pluto? I remember I at some so. point they were like yeah. P5 and P4 yeah, and stuff that's like Nix that. And right. Hy- there's Nix, Hydra, Styx, and... There's something it? like Mbop or something like that. <laughs> Probably not Mbop. <laughs> oh, something Hansen. like that. Something like that. I'll be honest, I like that song. Well, uh, yeah. Well, it may have felt like the time for Niso to orbit Neptune. Mm-hmm. It was just another episode of Walk About the Galaxy. If you like this episode of Walk About the Galaxy, write us a review in Klingon because mm-hmm. that would be really cool. <laughs> <laughs> be sure to like us on Facebook to get all our updates and check out our website at walkaboutthegalaxy.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Walk About the Galaxy, where you can imagine Diego running our cameras. <laughs> Catch up on old episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks to our listeners in Wales and around the world. And Follow Nebraska. Us, and Nebraska. <laughs> Follow us on Twitter. At walk underscore the underscore galaxy. And ask us questions anywhere using hashtag walk about the galaxy. You can also hear the Astro Quirks if you're in the central Florida area on Are We There Yet? Tuesdays at 630 on FM 90.7 and 89.5 or 3 WMFE and WMFV. Our theme music was composed by Richard Drusick. Our production assistant video guru is Diego Rodriguez. I'm Josh Caldwell. I'm Addie Dove. I'm Jim Cooney. We're the Astro Quark signing off until the next episode of Walk About the Galaxy. Mm Bop. Buy a shirt.